The F-35 is the future. Is it? Well, probably. But today on the Damcasters, we're going to look at its troubled past and difficult present to see what the future may hold. Welcome to the Damcasters, brought to you in association with the Pima Air and Space Museum. I'm your host, Matt Bone. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. And it's warm. The window's open. There is an ice cream truck outside. So this is the dedication I put into these shows that I'm not running out to get myself a 99 flake that probably costs, I don't know, five quid these days. But today we're going to be looking at the F-35. Now, aviation history show, why are we discussing the F-35? Well, this thing's been going for a long time and it has been costing a fortune. So we're going to be digging into that. But as always, we have to thank our fabulous sponsors at the Pima Air and Space Museum out of Tucson, Arizona, where it is likely much hotter than it is here in sunny Sussex. They have some fantastic events coming up soon, including their Night Wings events, which, given how warm it is in July, that's probably going to be a good time to go. They've got some astronomy bits coming on. All the links for that will be in the description below. Do head over to see them. It really is an incredible place. And just before we get going, really, we need to do a quick shout out as well to Niels Henkemans, whose book, Defending Normandy, which has been talked about on so many pods, is real. It's in the live. It arrived this morning and it's fantastic. I'll pop a link in the description below. Niels has been doing some incredible work here and it is really, really eye opening. And from what I've read, it has been worth the wait. But today, F-35, and we're going to be chatting with veteran aviation journalist and independent aviation analyst, Bill Sweetman, whose latest book is The Trillion Dollar Train Wreck: How the F-35 Hollowed Out the United States Air Force. And it's not a big book, but goodness does Bill pack a lot in. And we're going to pick out a few elements of this. A lot of it is programmatic issues through the program that have increased costs. And being a business analyst, we get a bit geeky, really, with some of those things. But when it comes down to it, we need to see where we are at the moment. And as most of us have the F-35 in their home nations, it's good to see where we're standing. And it's interesting because we're also going to have to discuss Tempest as well. So... I guess we have to start at the beginning and find out when Bill started looking into this thing. So I, I guess as as a veteran aviation correspondent, Bill, how long have you been following and analyzing what was the Joint Strike Fighter, now the F-35? How, how long has this thing been going on for you? Amazingly, um, almost uh, almost 40 years. Um, <laughs> because the, 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 the precursor of Joint Strike Fighter um, was something called US UK A Stovall, and the MOU was signed in um, at uh, NASA Ames Research Center in 19, January of 1986. And um, I don't exactly know why the hell I got um, the, the message through, but um, I was uh, invited to that. I was living in the Bay Area at the time, um, jumped into my white. Volkswagen GTI, which I was driving then, um, scooted over and um, and there there the MOU got signed. Um, now, of course, it went through a lot of uh, quite a lot after that before it became Joint Strike Fighter, uh, but um, that was where that was where it started. Um, then it became JSA what, about ten years later. And I, I guess you know there's so much noise around this now and we're going to get into that in a bit but i guess let's start at the beginning with with that very interesting concept of of the joint strike fighter is it realistic to sort of call it this idea for an everything fighter the sort of post history world you only need one thing to do all the jobs is that a sort of a reasonable summation of it yeah I mean, you had to look back to, you know, back to the, the formative years, because really the, the, the first ace Oval program ran into a lot of problems. None of the concepts they were looking at really worked. So Joint Strike Fighter itself really took place right after the end of the Cold War, which was, you know, pretty shattering. And at the time, you know, it, it looked like, you know, Russia was never to rise again. Um, 
and we weren't even beginning to see modernization in China, you've got a tremendous amount of churn and a tremendous, tremendous amount of uncertainty. It's like, well, we've got all these combat aircraft, we've got a very modern air force. You know, do we just stop doing anything like end of World War I? Um, but how do we keep, you know, how does the US, how does the industry and the military, how do they keep up the, uh, maintain the muscle to, to replace what they have, which, as I said, is not an urgent requirement. So out of that comes two things that are very closely linked. Uh, one is a big program that uh, will solve all our issues, uh, replace everything, uh, but not until 2010. That's you know, almost, almost 20 years away from, from the start point. And the other is, well, we use this big program to force industry to consolidate because we've still got, um, I mean, we still had I think, seven companies that uh, responded to the advanced tactical fighter, which was F-22. And, you know, there's just no way we can sustain seven, seven companies anymore. So at, at the time that the JSF requirement is evol evolving, Deputy Defense Secretary Bill Perry invites the uh, bosses of industry in 1993 to a private dinner at his home and uh, proceeds to tell them, you're either going to get, you're either going to merge or go out of business. And that creates this huge wave of mergers uh, and, you know, brings together most of the companies on three JSF candidates. Um, and eventually you, you have one visit, uh, winning, winning JSF team which uh, Northrop Grumman joins with, um, with Lockheed Martin after, after Lockheed Martin gets selected. And then when Donald Douglas loses that down select in 1996, then uh, the immediate result is they, they go and um, are acquired by Boeing, which of course has massive effects on the industry to this day. So it, it's sort of this post Last Supper it becomes the sort of bastard child of appropriation, really, doesn't it? The, the, as everything starts funneling down towards these things, it mm -hmm. takes on a life of its own. Yeah, it becomes it, it, it becomes a political and industrial concept. And within that, that's probably why you're able to hammer together a, a requirement which ostensibly can be met by a single aircraft. Hmm. At the same time, at the same time, they're going, you know, they've also... Um, the U.S. has a long-standing goal of maintaining its status on global markets, international markets. Mm -hmm. um, if you look, you know, pre-JSF, end of Cold War, well, it looks like you know there's some new, new, new products um, coming out of Europe. But uh, you know, F-16, F-18 are getting a little old. So there has been a long-standing requirement to do something for the export markets. And again, one function of JSF is to sustain and expand U.S. dominance on the on the international market. So it it, it really is this multi pronged beast, isn't it? You, things I guess the things like the Eurofighter, Gripen, Rafael, all, all all of these other sort of slightly lighter weight projects are put putting the fear into the export market that the U.S. have mm -hmm. had tied up for so long. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. One of the things that jumped out to me quite early in, in, in your book was the original timeline for the F-35, which had completely passed me by. Because was it 2025 the production run was originally supposed to end? Did, am I remembering I, I that right? Was, I think I'm remembering it looking back at the original documents after uh, the time that Lockheed, was, Lockheed Martin was selected to build the F-35 itself. That was 2001. At that time, I think the final order for the Air Force was something like fiscal 27, 26, which would have been a 2028, 20, 2029 delivery. So essentially by now, yeah, they would be almost done if they'd stayed on, stayed on schedule. And they were going to build at a rate of 110 a year just for the Air Force. And the Navy and Marines would have been finished even quicker. Which, which, is, which is mad. And we're going to get into why that is mad now but for for, for the, the the two people listening and watching this who aren't quite sure what the f-35 is I, I suppose we should really 
explain what it's become because it's mm. not one aircraft, even though that's what the sales pitch is, is it? It's three distinct flavors that kind of look the same. And I think that's probably where the similarities between the yes. three come to an end. Would you mind sort of just giving us that sort of posted, what does A, B, and C mean when we when we see these things come up and when, <laughs> when we see our tax pounds head, heading heading off in that direction for, 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 for A's and B's? Yeah. Well, what you've got coming off the assembly line now is a strike fighter, probably more oriented towards bombing than air combat. Um, and the, 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 there are three versions, and they have basically very similar avionics and, and mostly similar propulsion. And I think, you know, I think the best way to look at it is to say that the, the, the core version is the Marine one, is the F-35B that is operated by the Marines of the Royal Air Force. And that's a short take vertical landing aircraft. And um, the, the key to how it works is that uh, the engine drives the engine in up and away flight. It's a normal jet engine um, for short takeoff, vertical landing. The, the engine has a shaft on the front that is clutched into a lift fan that's installed vertically behind the cockpit. And the, the lift fan does two things. One is it balances out the lift front and rear between the vectoring nozzle at the back and the lift fan, so that the thrust is going through the center of gravity. Um, and the other is it greatly increases the air volume through the whole power plant. In a sense, it is a variable cycle engine. Um, that's what provides uh, almost 40,000 pounds of vertical lift for the aircraft. Then for the Air Force, you take that aircraft and, and you remove the vectoring nozzle, the shaft, and the lift fan. And uh, that actually gives you slightly larger weapon base. And then the Navy, again, a bit like the Air Force aircraft, except because it has to land on a carrier, it needs a very much larger wing, as, as well as you know strength and structure and the rest of hook. So you've got an aircraft there, there that's got an extremely large wing and... Um, Consequently, it ha has a big drag disadvantage of transonic and, and, and supersonic speeds. Uh, but again, also has a larger weapon base, the Air Force aircraft. And um, the, the aircraft is designed to have a fairly large measure of stealth. Um, that means that the surfaces, the, the external surfaces are all aligned or angled um, to reduce radar reflectivity. And it also means that the primary weapon load uh, which is in the order of 5,000 pounds for the two, for, for the Air Force and Navy aircraft, the primary weapon load is carried, um, is, is carried internally in weapon bays out uh, to either side of the engine. When you have a vertical takeoff aircraft, it's very difficult to do that um, if you have more than one engine for various reasons, but basically if you have two engines, you have twice the chance of an engine failure but if it's in vertical flight, you're not you 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 can't you're not going to stay airborne. <laughs> so um, so VTOL aircraft usually have only one primary engine. That means that uh, when you start configuring the aircraft, and it's got a very large engine, you've got to wrap everything around that engine tunnel, and that leads you to a somewhat complicated internal layout. Um, but just to back up just a bit, um, initially it was thought that. Actually, that was very much like how the aircraft would be put together. Yeah, you just take, you know, take the engine, take the lift fan out for the Air Force aircraft, put a fuel tank in there. Um, for the Navy version, uh, even use a sort of almost common wing structure, but put a sort of expanded picture frame around it. So the, the idea was these were going to be very common aircraft. Um, now, but then partly because you've got this huge engine tunnel down the middle, and that much complexity in how the aircraft put to get, gets put together, um, when they actually start doing the design after contract, they start doing detailed design, the empty weight explodes. They get the worst overruns I think we've seen on almost any aircraft in recent history. And of course, completing critical design review, um, the aircraft become very much more different. So uh, while the engines and the avionics remain and the cockpit remain fairly similar, um, the airframes become, in detail, I think almost entirely different uh, because you have to do so much weight saving on the, on the vertical takeoff aircraft. And on the carrier version, they got into a sort of 
wing area versus weight spiral, <laughs> where they <laughs> kept having to add wing, but of course that added weight, so uh, weight and drag, so um, you know more weight, more drag, um, and you get and so you ended up with a very much larger wing than on on the uh, on either of, on the other two versions. So yeah, you lost a lot of commonality there. Which to the layman would say that kind of is starting to negate the purpose of the concept in the first place, isn't it? If, if, if you're starting to diverge that much, that's going to create a lot of the, well, the problems that we're going to discuss really, because the, the as you describe in your book, the trillion dollar train wreck, which I thoroughly enjoyed and links in the description below to, to grab your own copy, dear listener. But you've got essentially three main customers for the aircraft in the Air Force, the Navy, and the Marines. You've got aircraft that are diverging from their original purpose. Now, almost every aircraft program has weight problems as things start going up. That's fine. But you've got three lots of these programs. Everything's becoming a multiple of three. How has the oversight been managed for this? Because in reading your book, that's what really surprised me is that Yes, it's been going on for so long. We're on president and administration. Was it five by now for this this program? Mm -hmm. How has this been managed? Because from with a day job hat on, the PMO for this is terrible. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's there's a couple of reasons. I mean, but first of all, this program is set up. It doesn't really have any very special kind of management, and it is a joint program, and it reports to the Office of Secretary of Defense. So, for example, I think the the the, the U.S. Air Force has been well, has been disappointed, damaged by the way this program has gone. But it's not their program. Um, it reports to it reports up to the to the Office of Secretary of Defense um, via, you know, whoever happens to be the procurement czar at that time. Um, you know, Under Secretary of Acquisition Technology and Logistics, I think. Now, the, the, and, and there's no sort of special mechanism, oversight board or anything like that that would kind of reflect the fact that this is really pretty important um, and a very large and complex program. And, you know, it's a massive massive i mean it's it's so much bigger than anything else that's going so that's that's problem one there's not, nothing special in there um and problem two is you know when does all this start happening it starts happening it starts going wrong about 2003 you still start, you start you see the weight problem happening what happens is that because you then redesign all the aircraft and you don't allow enough time to redesign the aircraft um, that cascades into the test program being late and we'll get into that later. But while all this is happening, um, nobody, nobody really in Washington gives a hoot about stealth combat aircraft because we've got the great war on global war on terror going. Um, you know, we're getting increasingly wrapped up in in the Middle East. The Secretary of Defense at the time, which would be initially Rumsfeld and then um, and then Gates. Their attitude towards any aircraft is those like, well, you know, we don't need combat aircraft right now. We need um, MRAPs. We need um, we need drones. So during part of this period, not only does the Air Force not control this program, but they hardly have a vote at all because um, in 2008, uh, Gates fires their, um, fires the chief of staff and the, and the and the Air Force secretary in part because they're not responding fast enough to his desire to get more drones in service. So it's this focus on that sort of the wayward coin counterinsurgency war that they were fighting then is taking them away, taking their eye off the ball from that peer-to-peer -peer level of technology that they're wanting in this program. So it's, yeah. it, it, it's I don't want to say muddled priorities because the priority for them at that time was very much the war that they were fighting and you've got a hangover program kind of trying to sort of shout <laughs> shout from the bleachers, isn't it? Yeah. And you start seeing this sort of cyclic effect in the program, which is that it's already become very important. I mean, it is the only F, only fight combat aircraft, new combat aircraft out there. Um, it, it 
required for, for all three services, for allies. Um, so there was a sense that oh, whatever happens, the show must go on. And certainly everybody's trying to avoid what's called a non-McCurdy breach, which would require the program to be recertificated. So what happens is when they hit a problem, they would define a sort of get well process. Okay, we're overweight, we're gonna fix the weight. Um, we need to redesign and fix the weight. But then they would say, well, yeah, but we're gonna do it this fast and for this much money, which always very optimistic. And in the end, it will have, you know, I think they said in the end, the weight redesign was going to add something like 18 months to the program. Well, the problem with that is, you know, you set optimistic targets, it's schedule driven, but in fact, it's very complicated to do. And the next thing you know, it's behind schedule um, and over budget. The next thing is while you're focusing on that, the next problem emerges and you miss it until it's too late. So for example, as the, the weight reduction problem involved redesigning three aircraft, that took a long lot more time than expected. Um, and so the aircraft that was supposed to come in and do flight testing uh, were delivered late and they weren't ready. And, you know, that was compounded by the, um, the, 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 the program office director at the time um, who wanted to, wanted to schedule to look good. So he prioritized first flight dates um, uh, and delivery dates for the, for, for the test aircraft. And what happened was they were signing off delivery aircraft as delivered that weren't ready to join the test program because by the time, uh, uh, as they were being built, more design changes were being implemented. So they signed them as delivered. They pushed them across the airfield or, or across, the, um, across the ramp to um, the individual aircraft barns on the side of the runway at Fort Worth. And um, in those barns, they got taken to pieces again and modified. So, you know, your test program was follow falling well behind. So, you know, again, you do a fix. You, um, and this this case, it was, oh, well, the aircraft are late, um, but you know what? Um, it's not really test, it's validation. And whenever you hear, hear those phrases, you should run very fast. <laughs> Um, you're you're giving me nightmares of a number of projects I've worked on. <laughs> and of course, this is happening at enormous scale. It's not really test, it's evaluate, validation. So we'll just chop a ton of, of sorties out of the test program. And so essentially, that process is going on in, in 2009, which is when Gates chops the F-22, um, announces that, you know, tells the world the F-35 is fine, it's on schedule, everything's going marvellous, uh, it's going to cost half as much as an F-22 and so forth. Anyway, um, Gates is being told that and apparently believes it, and nobody quite dares to contradict him until, uh, until he gets a new deputy, Ashton Carter, um, the late Ashton Carter, who starts looking into this and goes, and realizes he's got a mess on his hands. So just a few months after Gates has been telling everybody how good he, well it's going, um, he's got to fire the program director, um, early 2010, fires the program director, um, brings in a new team, um, the, the Admiral Vinlet, Dave Vinlet and, um, and Chris Bogdan, and they realize they fire a lot of people. <laughs> but then they realize that it's such a mess, it takes them another three years, more than three years, to actually establish a schedule for getting to IOC. And, and what, sorry, what is IOC? Just initial for... operation cap operational mm -hmm. capability. Um, and that's a very paper operational capability. And, you know, the, 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 they establish I think, IOC dates for the Air Force, uh, I think the Marines, then the Air Force and the Navy, but, you know, well ahead of a useful capability. And they do that by, um, they do that by deferring a lot of capability to later programs, la later, later upgrades.
that. You've wonderfully described this as the the old woman who swallowed a fly approach yes. to, to program management. And, and that it's wonderfully apt because, you know, in your book, you look at a, a number of case studies where it's that, what is the get well and what is the problem that that leads to? It's, it's constantly troubleshooting and never really moving things forward. And, you know, in, in, in IT, it's bug fixing in production. It's, it's the last thing you want to be doing. So by the time that they're, they're, they're firing all these people, this is at the point at which they're supposed to be building over a hundred aircraft a year. By the time they're firing people, which is now in, which is now you know well into fiscal twenty ten, they've already started production. The first production aircraft were ordered in, um, ordered in two thousand seven, and it's supposedly in low rate initial production, uh, but th th there is. Um, there is a ramp inherent in production um, to try and get, you know, the idea being to try and keep the unit cost down. So, you know, all the while, I mean, by the time they've got, you know, by the time they actually have some IOC dates, um, they're, produce, they're building dozens of aircraft a year. And eventually, two things are happening at this point. One is that a lot of the problems are beginning to concentrate in software. And the other is that by about 2015, the Air Force is beginning to uh, demonstrate concern, show concern, because the aircraft that they're going to get for IOC, which is so-called Block 3, isn't the aircraft they really want. Um, they want a um, combination of enhancements, um, fixes, and... Also, obsolescence cures because you know these are systems that have been de designed already, you know, nearly twenty years ago, or uh, a requirement that was defined twenty years ago. Um, uh, an aircraft that was being under development for fourteen years, and so yeah, those are the things that they want to change, and so Air Force starts saying, "Look, we want to restrain, hold back on buying aircraft. You know, stick to about forty-two a year." Um, until Block 4 comes along. So the Air Force has been trying to do that, and Congress tends to push back and, uh, and, 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 and procure more aircraft. Meanwhile, because the U.S. rate is uh, the, the, the rate at which the DOD is buying is not quite where it's supposed to be, the Allied customers, um, particularly like Australia and Norway, um, are being you know pushed and controlled to buy all their aircraft early. So they've got a lot of aircraft now that are going to be require expensive fixes. But then in background, you've got a couple of other issues going. One is that um, is heat management, thermal management, which is, you know, it's, it's an issue on any aircraft, but a stealth aircraft is, it's been described as a bit like a sort of thermos bottle rather than a, it's, you, it's, it's, you can't just cut holes in it for air cooling here and there. Um, and so you know the you have to get rid of the rid of the heat via the engine exhaust through the fan through the fa the, the fan duct um, or dump it into the fuel and burn it. But you've only got so much capacity within within the engine and within the thermal management system to handle that. So um, thermal management starts to become a, a a running issue and something that in the long term, is going to have to be fixed. Um, the other thing, of course, is software. Just, just on the thermal issue, because yeah. the, the, the thing that is fascinating about the F-35 is how it's designed to dump as much heat as possible into the fuel. And when I saw one fly a few years ago, I was astonished at the heat plume coming out of the back of it. You could see it from quite a ways away. And, of course, that was step one to negating stealth, was to use the infrared spectrum to start seeing these things when they weren't showing up on radar. So this problem is compounding and drawing on and is actually hampering that sort of main stealth element of it. Because, you know, we're going to talk about software just in a second, but you're having hardware problems trying to be fixed by software, which is taking more energy, which is creating more heat which then brings you to the other thing, which I didn't put on the list, but of course they're now talking about it needing a new engine as well. So it's this sort of problem upon problem 
that is, for, from my standpoint, almost insurmountable at, at this point in time. As, as if I was working in that program office, the post-its on the wall would just be wallpaper by this point of, of, of issues. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of bad stories in this, but um, <laughs> well, when, the, when the program started, there was actually, I mean, the, 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 it, was, it was part of the plan to develop an alternate engine. And GE and Rolls-Royce were doing that, um, the engine called the F-136. And, and again, and they, they were running a bit later than Pratt & Whitney. That was, again, part of the plan. They would compete in later lots of production. And because they were running later, they could kind of see this thermal problem coming up, as well as, you know, as well as the fact the aircraft would probably just naturally tend to need more power. Um, so they designed their engine with a little bit bigger core airflow, a little bit more airflow generally, and a little more in reserve to be able to handle some of these some of these issues. But then in 2006, as the cost overruns start to hit, um, the the Pentagon, Lockheed Martin, Pratt and Whitney, all quietly agree that um, yeah, we should get rid of this alternate engine and use the money for something else. GE obviously will lobby against it, so you get a big um, a big fight going on in Washington. The tactic used by Pratt and Whitney is to argue that you know they won competitions to be the engine on the F-35 and this is purely political to give a GE some work and of course you know, they never won a competition <laughs> um, and yet they, they, they kept saying this and eventually eventually about five years later GE Rolls said you know they gave up um, but you know that could have helped us today you actually need to redesign the engine so that it can provide more, uh, I think because you can then bleed more airflow off into the power and thermal management system, and that can then you know, recirculate heat more effectively. And well, that's, what, that's what's being done. Now, there was another option, which was to change the engine completely and put in one, uh, a brand new adaptive cycle engine. And that was being considered up until a couple of years ago. And then somebody found out or decided that that wouldn't work for the Marines. It wouldn't, you couldn't adapt that engine to the Stovall cycle, which is quite possible. And so we're back with a warmed over version of the F-135. Uh, it's sole source, of course, to Pratt & Whitney, now part of RTX. They're going to change out the thermal management system as well, which is a very complicated bag of tricks. And that will be sole source to somebody as well. So if you really think that we're just going to end up replacing the engine core at the end of this, um, oh, you sweet summer child, it's going to be a new engine. <laughs> it's, it's funny how those things always end up that way. Don't yeah. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break to pop to the Pima Air and Space Museum to visit with Director of Collections Andrew Bailey and find out about one of the aircraft in the incredible Pima collection. Welcome here to the Pima Air and Space Museum. It's 108 degrees out in the desert, so what better aircraft to talk about than the Mirage? The Dussault Mirage III was one of the iconic Cold War fighter airplanes. It was the first European fighter that could fly past Mach 2 in level flight. The Israelis used it in combat in the Middle East, and the Argentinians used them in combat in the Falklands. In the 1960s, the Swiss government just chose the Dussault as their new fighter aircraft. The aircraft was built under contract in Switzerland, but had to have many modifications made to it. Hoist points were put on the aircraft to allow it to be carried inside the caves that they were stored in on the mountainsides. JATO rockets had to be used on it for short takeoffs on Swiss airfields. And the radar and a lot of the avionics were replaced from French air avionics to American avionics. This led to huge cost overruns. The aircraft went over 66% over budget and led to what was known as the Mirage Affair, which essentially meant several high-ranking Air Force officers and government officials lost their jobs over it. 
The fighter version went into service in 1966, and the reconnaissance version went into service in 69. The reconnaissance version, like the one that we have here, had the radar on the nose replaced with a suite of cameras. It could also carry a reconnaissance pod on the underside. It still retained defensive armament. It had two 30 millimeter cannons and could also use the AIM-9 Sidewinder. The Mirage RSs went out of service in 2003, giving service to the Swiss Air Force 30 plus years. To find out what's going on at the Pima Air and Space Museum and to see the incredible collection that they have, please visit www www.pimaair.org for more information and be sure to give them a follow via all the links in the description to this episode. And now back to the show. It's maddening to a degree looking at it from the outside because what quite possibly could could be a, a very good aircraft is, is, is lost in in all of this phenomenal amount of noise that's around it and poor management. We've, we've spoken about the U S air force, U S Navy, U S Marine Corps. If it was just those three, this would be tricky enough. But as you've mentioned before, we've got a phenomenal sales push on this aircraft as well mm -hmm. through all the NATO partners. So you, you've mentioned Australia, Norway, RAF fleet air arm. It, Canada's just finally been convinced to go to go for it as as well. It it seems well, it it is an incredible, incredible sales marvel for the amount of orders that are coming in for it. But then that adds more complexity due to adding more requirements into a mix when they can't fix the requirements that they've already got outstanding for the original three. How has that sort of you, you mentioned you called it the, the the sovereignty issue around the aircraft as mm -hmm. well. How does that get? Because I can remember there being tales of the data streams coming from the aircraft having to go through the, the U.S. first before it could come to the RAF controllers and things like that because of the prior um, pri uh, prior priority. Um, you know the word when somebody owns the the proprietary. Yes, the proprietary issues on it. Yeah. It just seemed very strange that anyone would want to lock themselves into it. It's it's almost like you're you're buying into an Apple ecosystem that isn't <laughs> that isn't being as updated as your iPhone. I mean that, that's a that's another another interesting part of the tale because if you go back again, you know, to go back, you this is all stuff that is a little, it can tends to get buried in history, but. Back in 2006, British Minister for Defence Procurement, Paul Drayson, was saying, oh, yeah, we, we are going to insist on having access to the source code. We want to be able to um, modify this aircraft. We want to be able to change, um, install, our, integrate our own weapons, uh, and uh, certainly want to be able to modify the mission data files, which a lot of that is a question of... Um, electronic order of battle information. Um, you know, we and, and Drayson said, well, we want to insist on this. And well, a few years later, um, uh, the official involved with the, uh, uh, um, possibly a guy at the Department of State named John Schreiber, um, State or Defense, um, just said, no, that, well, no, that isn't going to happen. We're not going to share source code. And um, so the situation today is that the, the submission data files for the aircraft are updated by a U.S. Air Force unit located at Eglin Air Force Base. And there are, I believe, three labs there. And th there is an um, basically an AUKUS lab, which is currently UK and Australia, but also, or will, will also be Canada. I think has a, I think they said it has about forty staff, forty um, non-US staff there, and then you go down to different levels, and the, the different labs have a few observers or just a few people in them, and so when you get to non-NATO, they really, there, there really is not a lot of, um, of of customer country involvement in that process, and at the same time you have. Um, you know, on board the 
on both the UK carriers and um, and the, and at at Marham, you have uh, US appointed um, security officers working uh, to ensure that everything is done according to US rules. So you know, for example, one issue was that, um, that came out in the in the accident report after the uh, after the F thirty five B trundled off the end of Queen Elizabeth and fell into the water. <laughs> um, the, the one issue that came out was that um, the, the 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 security officers had declared the deck to be a sterile area, and so the very few opportunities for the crew to come out and get, get any fresh air on the deck, and that was being listed as a cause of a, a cause of crew fatigue and um, possibly a, a con contribution to the accident. So you've got very tight control. To the point where you're not letting people near the aircraft that they're supposed to be maintaining, getting used to operating around all of those yeah. sorts of things. And then you then you get some of the things going on, like in Switzerland, uh, there is the, the airbase, one of the airbases, the first airbase that's supposed to get F-35s. The, the, the security people, the US security people are looking at this and realizing, oh yeah, well, it's actually a public highway that runs straight across the base. <laughs> and... And there's a hotel on the on the valley side overlooking the base that was owned by Chinese people. Um, <laughs> so they had a fit. The, the Swiss launched a security investigation. And in fact, one of the things that made the Chinese look very suspicious was that they weren't um, they were not interested in Swiss culinary traditions. <laughs> it's like, dude, you know. Um, 90% of Chinese are lactose intolerance and a good fondue night would put them in the hospital. I mean, what do you expect? It, it, it's, it's a very slim vertical slice when you start talking about Swiss cuisine. To, to any Swiss listeners, I'm, I'm happy for you to, to feed me, to prove me wrong. But that's, uh, but yeah, I, I, I spent a lot of time up at, at Bodo in, in northern Norway as well. And you can see right across that airfield from multiple vantage points as well. And considering that's the sort of main base for intercepting mm. Russian aircraft, knocking on the door, coming across the top with their F-16s at the moment, similar sorts of problems will, will crop up, crop up there when the, the Royal Norwegian mm. Air Force start operating them up yeah. that far. I, I gather too, um, that in Australia, there is a, security level required for personnel on the F-35 program, that it's very hard, if not impossible, to reach that if you're not Australian born. And that's very restrictive because uh, Australia has a lot of highly skilled immigrants. I did know that is very interesting and confusing considering having just interviewed Nick Radoescu, the commander of the 355th Operations Group, who was born in Romania and is now training all the US Air Force A-10 pilots. So if if he was Australian, he wouldn't have the clearance to to have access to, to levels of data on the aircraft. I mean, it seems to be, it, 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 it seems to be that that's an, Aust uh, a, a, an Australian policy. That's what I've been told by some people who are familiar with the situation. Very strange. There's so many layers to this, and you crammed a lot into a slim volume look, looking at this, and you've done it very concisely, Bill, so thank, thank you for that. But just to start wrapping up our chat and telling people, go off, and buy the trillion-dollar train wreck, which will probably be $2 trillion by the time you do the, the revised version of it. But you know, this aircraft is supposed to be replacing things like the a10 supposed to be replacing down down the down the way you're fight things we're in this position where it, it can't really do that can it you know but is it just going to be like like a big mac it's going to be something that we know and see and it's expected to to be be the thing even though it it can't really do the job well i think it's you know it's 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 core mission i mean if you look at the aircraft and you look at what it was what it was designed to do and i think from that point of view, the Air Force, the U.S. Air Force, probably drove the requirement. Um, you know, this is just um, the, the, this is all being put together um, just a few years after Gulf, the, the Gulf War One Desert Storm, and they're saying, "Well, what we want is something that can do what an F one seventeen does, um, 
that is, drop a couple of high-precision bombs, we're likely to be able to survive in daylight um, and have some capability to attack through adverse weather. So we need radar um, and we need some air-to-air -air capability on it. Um, but that's all kind of secondary. And um, yeah, and as for range, well, you know, our primary theater of operation might be about as large as the Desert Storm Theater. If we can get a range that's a bit better than an F-16, then, then we're kind of happy. Now, if you're talking about the Pacific now, you're kind of short of range. And you've also got um, some very sophisticated adversaries who are doing things to uh, reduce the value of stealth, to, you know, to some extent, uh, use counter stealth. And you know, some of that is going to be effective. Um, so what you've got really is, uh, is, is, is an aircraft that's probably going to be quite effective as a bomber, as a strike aircraft in European range, in, in, the, um, in, the, in the European or Middle East range context. Doesn't really have the legs to operate from outside the threat rings in the, in the Pacific, uh, which becomes, you know, it's okay. They have a lot of aircraft that do that. Um, but ideally you'd want a bit more range. As for air to air, it doesn't really have performance of, uh, of something, it doesn't have the performance of something like Typhoon. In fact, I've just, I've just revised the book a little bit and I've included some of this. But um, stealth in air to air is a bit questionable. If you are, you know, looked at F-22 versus an early Su-27, yeah, you were probably going to see it way out. Um, and be able to engage it before you detect it. There is a lot more to um, air to air now because uh, electronic surveillance measures on board the standard fighter have improved. Everybody's got AESA. Everybody's got a bit of um, front sector radar cross section reduction. And it just makes the business of seeing without being seen seeing without being detected because of your radar emissions, it makes it that little bit harder. And as you mentioned, there's also the infrared. The US, a long time ago, um, as they were finalizing the specs for the F-22, they looked at where infrared was then and they said, oh, you know, it's not that good. It's not worth it. We're not going to do it. And they kind of stopped developing infrared search and track. And, um, most particularly um, the Typhoon program led by Leonardo persisted very hard with IRST, primarily as a counter jamming uh, sensor. And they have got to places where I think the US hasn't quite realized they've got to places. Which, which is fascinating because it's sort of around that time um, that Dale Zelko gets shot down in the self fighter over Serbia, isn't it? And that was. IR assisted. It, it, mm. It's 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 a it's a weird decision making pro process. I, I suppose it, it, it's time to to bring in our interesting sort of final question here, which is the two new elephants in the room, which are these new multinational programs that are springing up in response to F thirty five, which I, I I don't think is a an unfair thing to to say. So mm. we've got the the future combat air system, and then. Um, the the G cap as well, which is yeah. getting a lot of a lot of noise now, tempest and, and things like that. Yeah. Are these things getting the traction that they are because of this sort of long just stated? I won't use the word nightmare, but it kind of is with, with the F thirty five. Are these things getting the traction that they are and the buy in from countries like Japan, uh, the UK, Italy? Is this because they're looking at the problems they're facing with the aircraft that they have bought and are saying, we need something different. We need something a bit lighter and a bit cheaper. To start, I mean, to start with FCAS or SCAF, if you're French, with, with that, I mean, the French, I think the French were always going to do their own thing if they possibly could. And, you know, for something like that, they can, you know, they can, they, they, they've, they've got Rafale. Rafale is still under being developed and improved. So, um, no, that was a pretty logical decision for them. Um, I think it's, I think GCAP is the more interesting one because back in 2015, 
in the in the strategic defense and security review the uk government said oh yeah we're still committed to 138 f-35s um and to barely said a word about any subsequent combat aircraft and i know that in 2016 well i was involved in discussions on well do you um does the uk perhaps want to get involved in the ucav program and you know we were getting some fairly positive vibes. And then very suddenly, you get this um, you know, massive strategic re reverse ferret. And by 2018, Farnborough 2018, um, Tempest is well underway. And then on the other side of the world, um, you know, Japan was you know, issuing an RFI for you know, a partner to develop their next aircraft. And they were saying, oh yeah, well, we do want, um, we, we want freedom of modification. And this is all through that damn RFI was, you know, freedom of modification. <laughs> and you can't guess how much attention the US paid to that. Um, if, you're, if your response is a, is, is a, vulgar, a vulgar expression ending in all, yeah, you may take your cookies from my desk. <laughs> and because, <laughs> It was absolutely inconceivable from the U.S. point of view that, the, that Jack, Japan would go off and work with the Brits, even though, you know, there was a discussion going on. They just, um, they just did not believe it would happen. So I think you know, sovereignty and integration of weapons and being able to control development, I think that that's a, that's, I mean, that is what got GCAP started. Um, and I think, but also another attribute of that is if you're not carrying the requirement for carrier, if you're not mm -hmm. carrying stovel, um, and you start looking at the aircraft and saying, well, maybe we want range, um, maybe range is important, then you can get better you know, range, speed, performance, payload performance out of the aircraft without making it a lot bigger or a lot more expensive. And if you look at the Tempest design, I, I, it's, it's kind of neat. Um, it has a big wing, big delta wing, that reminds me a bit of the Boeing X-32, the losing contender at JSF. And, you know, while X-32 didn't work very well, um, you could get an immense amount of fuel in that wing, and that was a smaller aircraft than GCAP. Yeah, I'm, I'm intrigued by Tempest. I think there's there's a lot of interesting things going on there, and of course, the French always make neat neat aircraft as as well. But I, I guess let, let's wrap this up with the the big question. I want to say what are the lessons learned and from from this? And I suppose things like GCAP Tempest is probably the outcome from it. But is is there something that through your analysis that you, you you're saying is sort of would be your your coda for a, a future program is it centralized management with an independent office that is going to be managing it is it proper oversight of it or what well i kind of conclude in my book that um in the book that the, the approach the french use and the swedes used um with um dga and fmv there's a very and there's an important bit of philosophy in there, which is those agencies don't report the armed services. They report the, the civilian ministry of defense. The armed services are their customer and they are the industry's customer. Um, but their job, above all, is to make sure things get delivered on time and on schedule. And in return, the ministry of defense the defense ministry supports them with very stable funding because it's you know it's chopped up funding which really destroys programs and it's program money not being available when you need it, it destroys programs they're involved at the first requirement stage and and because it's their job to make, make sure things come in on time they are kind of the gatekeepers against uh false optimism whereas where have you got an individual service com customer dealing with contractors, they have, they have the incentive, very strongly in the States and certainly in the UK, they have the incentive to accept the contractor's optimistic 
estimate and pass that on to to to, um, to the Ministry of Defence because that gives them a better chance of getting their program started and they're competing with the Navy and they're competing with the Army. And that's where you get, you know, that's where you get all this early optimism and subsequent budget shortfalls that you see as being chronic to so many programs. So I think um, improved management and I think another lesson is to professionalize customer management. You've got a lot of very junior people making decisions about large amounts of money and then and they don't really have the background to do that. And then you've got senior people making decisions and you know, far too many of them are thinking about retirement and directorships. <laughs> and, and they're all thinking about the aggregate, uh, about the interests of their own service too. So they're all in this sort of business of, well, if we can, you know, as long as we can get the program sold to start with, then we can take, you know, somebody else can take care of the overruns later. Mm. And, and I suppose that's, that's a whole other area that we haven't talked about is yeah. retirement board positions post retirement for these. Yes. That, that's, that's a whole, whole murky, murky world that is a, a different podcast. Bill, like I said, I, I found your book fascinating. Um, and slightly terrifying <laughs> as, as you start pulling up the weeds on this thing. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for your time. Do, do you want to give it, give it a plug? You said you've just updated it because it's, yeah, it's available just, uh, everywhere, isn't it? Yep. It's, it's available worldwide um, through Amazon um, Kindle direct initially uh, 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 as a paperback. I think, I think now you, the, the, the edition on sale is the, is the updated paperback. And um, sometime this afternoon or over the weekend, I'm going to be uploading a Kindle version. I'm learning all these, all, all these electronic publishing skills. So it will be available in two formats. And uh, I'll continue, I will continue updating it as, uh, as events proceed. So again, one of the nice things about this uh, new world of publishing. I, I think the best review I've heard of it was was uh, the guys in the Aviation Week podcast who said it wasn't long enough. And I wholeheartedly concur. But if you're going to keep updating it, I'll, I'll have to get an, an updated version. Bill, this has been a delight. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. Well, thank you. Well, thank you. It's been good. I cannot thank Bill Sweetman enough for joining us here on the Damcasters and for his book, which has been updated since I've read it, which, of course... Links are in the description below to both this and the new Kindle edition, which has been updated since this one has come out. So do check all those out because this is very interesting, especially when we start considering the alternatives that are coming up with the likes of Tempest, which we'll have to look at in a future episode. In the descriptions are all the links to Bill's socials. He is active on Twitter X, Exeter whatever we're calling it this week. And there's a lot of insights that have come through. As the guys at, over on Aviation Week said, it's not long enough. So if he's expanding it, great. We'll have to have Bill back to chat about some other things as well. As always, thank you for your incredible support. If you fancy becoming a damn Kisteer and getting these episodes early, that would be wonderful of you. It's just £3 a month plus a bit of that at the bottom tier. And we've got our Zoom social coming up at the end of july so that zoom social three and we're going to get some guests in for that to see what we can do so if you're over there you can join us it's saturday evening crack open some drinks and we gossip about stuff i'm thinking airplane films if in my brain because i have an idea but you have to be a damn castier for that again bill's book links in the description below please do grab that because I was fascinated by it and made quite angry about it and also made some of my professional projects that didn't go exactly the plan feel a bit better. Next time we are going to be chatting with Adam Higginbotham about the Challenger disaster and his new book, Challenger, which is a good title. It's a fabulous book. And when I'm recording this, we haven't actually spoken yet. So I'm really looking forward to that discussion because I watched that happen on telly when I was a youngin. So, yeah, it was real. Anyways, Challenger next. We'll see what else we've got. Become a damn caster. You'll get it almost as soon as it's finished in the edit. So 
Thank you so much. Thank you to Pima. Remember, check out Nils's book as well. And if you're in Tucson and you fancy doing something in the evening hours, night wings. Sounds great. I won't be around for that because I'm sensibly avoiding Arizona until it gets a bit cooler. Maybe November. We shall see. Thank you. Do take care of yourselves. Check in on your friends. Make sure everybody's okay. And until next time, bye-bye. I just want to say many thanks to our fabulous Dam Castiers on Patreon. If you head over to our Patreon page, you can join the crew and get your name in the credits from just £3 a month plus a bit of that. The Damcasters is hosted and produced by Matt Bowe and is a Boney Abroad podcast production.